Okay, good evening. My name is Nicole Bredesen. I am the founder and owner of Cookies Then Milk. It is a handcrafted product designed for breastfeeding women. And first let me explain to you why I have created a product specifically for breastfeeding women. Although three million women initiate breastfeeding, only about 100,000 continue to a year. The consequences are beginning to show. In 2011, the Surgeon General made a call to action. The time has come to set forth the important responsibility to enable mothers to breastfeed. In this 100-page document, the Surgeon General estimates that if the number of breastfeeding women doubled, the United States would save over $10 billion. Clearly, infant nutrition is a huge industry. Companies getting on board now have the opportunity to claim large portions of the market. Mothers and babies are born with the intrinsic understanding of the nurturing process. Sadly, the health benefits are often ignored in order to meet other needs, for example, low milk supply. With low milk supply, the threat of SIDS or adult obesity is trumped by babies' needs uh, for food. Basically, the body determines how much milk to make based on the law of supply, how often and how much the baby is eating. If each breast is not completely drained frequently throughout the day, the body receives the signals that the milk is not needed and begins to produce less. There are other causes of low milk supply, such as postpartum hemorrhage, low iron, even the use of medications, everything from anesthesia to Sudafed, basically. Um, and that is why millions turn to formula. The psychological vulnerabilities of new mothers sacrifices the needs of children. The International Breastfeeding Journal states that the absence of breastfeeding is significantly associated with the increase in the odds of a child having autism. The odds are already 1 in 88. I believe that if we support breastfeeding mothers through obstacles like low milk supply, they can rest assured that while they may never cure every cold or sniffle, they've done what science tells us is the best possible chance. The benefits of breastfeeding are unmistakable. Cookie Send Milk is a real world answer to problems like low milk supply. A customizable lactation solution that supports lactating mothers in producing and maintaining an adequate milk supply in a very short amount of time. Cookies and Milk is a full line of all natural, delicious, everyday foods, including brownies, cookies, waffles, muffins, and most flavors are available in gluten-free, even organic. Dietary concerns should not be a concern in a problem like low milk supply. Cookies and Milk has become known as the cookies you want for the milk you need. My product is a mix instead of a finished cookie or muffin in order to leave the consumer in control of which ingredients they choose to add to meet their family's needs. So the product can be fat-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, even completely vegan. Cookies and Milk is the only lactation support food that offers families this freedom. The three key ingredients, oatmeal, flaxseed, and brewer's yeast, form a powerful blend of lactation-enhancing properties that are full of iron, fiber, omega-3 fatty acids, B vitamins. It's a cookie that supports breastfeeding and good health. After eating our cookies, the average woman will see an increase in her supply between one and three days. Some mothers get as much as four times the amount that they usually get when pumping. 
and our mixes are affordable. Cookies and milk products cost less than half the price of every single competitor's finished product. At only $18.99 per package, consumers will be wondering why other companies are charging up to $50 for the same amount of cookies. The attention that my website has already grabbed shows me that people expect more of grassroots businesses like mine. In this economy, they want the biggest bang for their buck. So, in phase one, I created a strong local presence in my hometown of Tampa, Florida, making my retail debut in high-end baby boutique, Thank You Mama, followed by stores in California and Toronto, expanding my business, business from nationwide to international. Excuse me. Cookies and Milk is now ready to move into phase two, a more aggressive national presence. As I said before, the science is there and the top doctors and lactation consultants are aware and supportive of breastfeeding cookies. World-renowned Dr. Jack Newman suggests them on his website and even Dr. Oz has featured lactation cookies on his television show several times. Within the next three years, I plan to be in retail stores nationwide. Retail stores will have to create a shelf for my product because there's never been anything like it before. Fortunately, there is very little competition at this point. In just under a year, we managed to beat the competition in every single category. We are the only licensed and registered company selling pre-made cookies and product mixes with a shelf life of a year. We offer affordable and high-end choices, but what really sets us apart is we have the ability to customize for dietary restrictions. We are the only lactation support food company at this time that can do something like that. As I said, formula in the United States alone is a $20 billion industry. The Surgeon General's call to action is bold. It challenges Americans to reclaim 90% of women that choose formula feeding over breastfeeding. The result would be the rise of a multi-billion dollar breastfeeding industry. With proper positioning and marketing, Cookies and Milk has the potential to capture a modest 1% of the customers being reclaimed from the formula industry in the next 365 days. This 1% is a focused target market of 29,000 women, which has the potential for a half million dollars profit in the first year alone. By year three, we aim to claim 2% of the market, and by year five, 5%. By year five, we will have begun to see just a small portion of the market potential for cookies and milk. Ladies and gentlemen, I have shared with you a problem in our nation. My solution to that problem and my plan for growth and expansion as a leading founder of change in this budding industry. I would like to ask that you join me tonight as I answer the Surgeon General's call to action and embrace my commitment to empower mothers to breastfeed. Thank you. Hi, that was great. Uh, tell me a little bit about production of the cookies. Absolutely. Um, I use a small commercial kitchen where I can produce a, a large quantity at one time, um, and I store them in my office, and then I ship them from home. It's not ideal, and my first um, plan for funding is to, be, to seek out faster means of production, which would also reduce the cost. But at this time, they are handcrafted by quantities of about four dozen at a time. Nicole, nice job. I just ate these, so I'm not going to start lactating, am I? I hope you're not. You're hope not. not. But good. You're still good to know. Other things. Little disclaimer. That's good. Uh, give me a sense of the market share of stats you gave us. Are those based on the number of people that are currently using formula, or the actual number of people who are currently breastfeeding? It's the number of people. It's it's a small number. It's 29,000 women, which is the one percent of the 90 percent. And um, over the last two years, there has been a rise in the number of women that are breastfeeding and breastfeeding for, um, from anywhere from one to three years. So that's 1% of the total number of growth. Okay, and two, two more questions related Absolutely. to that. Uh, do you have, currently have a relationship with folks like the La Leche League or people that are really hardcore breastfeeders? Absolutely. Um, I'm working with a lactation consultant in Florida where I'm from at the, time, at the moment. Um, currently, we're running a study of about 60 women that's going to go for two years. That's going to follow how um, our product increases their supply, what kind of differences that they see. Um, and then my plan going forward, um, I've recently been invited to the world's largest baby shower run by Dr. Oz. And there I would get to meet with him and discuss with his consultants how to promote the product um, once I do have the research behind me. Cool. And Lassa, what's your revenue been in your first year? Well. <clears throat> um, 
We had a lot of startup cost, um, and we made about $470 profit the first year. That was that was very very good presentation, Nicole. I had, I just have one question. That is beyond five years. What other markets do you see this product going into? Is it a health food? Absolutely, um, it definitely is a health food. Um, I do see it expanding further beyond that, though. Where I'd like to start is um, hospitals, birth centers, somewhere that it's easily accessible, where mothers know right away, or even people that are looking to gift a mother would know where to find it, and then expand from there into Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, so on. Hi, Nicole. Nice job. Um, I, I was unclear how you're going to protect your market share. So you, you talked about the competitors a little bit, but what, what's really the barrier to somebody uh, copying you? There's not a barrier to someone copying the idea at all. Um, the difference, I think, is quality and effectiveness. I spent two years researching um, the different ingredients, the recipe, uh, the, and building a reputation, which has continued to follow me for the last couple of years. Um, when I first started, the product that I came out with was effective, but it, it, it tasted bad in layman's terms. And um, it took me a long time to get to the point where people know by name that they can rely on this product. So it is brand recognition. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, one quick question about your pricing. Mm -hmm. I think you, you mentioned that yours was a lot less it is. than the competitors. Mm -hmm. um, can you just elaborate a little bit more on the thought process and where you can go with that? Absolutely. Um, I'm the only company currently that produces a mix. I do also sell pre-made cookies, but the other three or four companies, um, there were four at one time and one is struggling. So uh, the other three or four companies only produce a pre-made cookie and they're about $1.40 on average per cookie. Mine run about 98 cents. And I, I'm not sure exactly why because I do use the highest products available. I use organic products. Um, and I think it's just the kind of thing where if you can't find it, you're, they're willing to to charge a lot because it's not something you can find. And I don't feel that that's necessary. I feel like it should be accessible to women, especially when it, there's incredible profit versus cost. So I've just decided to make it a lower price so that it's accessible. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, is it, a, I miss maybe, is it available online or only through retail stores? It is available online. Um, I have a website that I run and then I also have uh, the store in California that I work with has a website as well that they sell through. And I'm just curious, um, I'm not quite sure what the rules around and how it works, but I know that if you have a baby, a lactation consultant actually comes in normally mm -hmm. through the hospital and meets with you. Yes. I think that would be an ideal time to kind of, they give you a bag full of wonderful things yes. to put your cookies in the bag. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that something that you have considered to try to market your product? Because it I is. Uh, actually, that's a really great question. The World Health Organization has started to name hospitals what they call baby friendly. And baby friendly hospitals going forward from 2010 aren't allowed to distribute products that are either way, formula or um, breastfeeding. So they're allowed to come in and consult with you, but they are going to discontinue giving out all formula samples. And so when I approached several hospitals, what I got was, because we can't distribute formula, we can't distribute your product for free, but they're willing to sell it in their gift shop. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, first off, I'd just like to say if anybody has any uh, family or friends in Boston, uh, I wish them the best and hope that everything's uh, going well and everyone's healthy. Um, aside from that, my name's Dave Murphy, and uh, this is Christiana Howe who helped me uh, pass out a few things today. And I am here to present the Tight Light. So, a little bit about me. Um, I come from a very entrepreneurial family. Uh, my dad, he started a landscaping business, went into real estate. My grandfather started a construction business, went into real estate. Um, basically, all my uncles, um, pretty much everyone in my family is an entrepreneur, and I'm just trying to carve a little piece out for myself and make the family proud. So, uh, from freshman year, me and my buddy Jack McAvoy were always trying to come up with get rich quick schemes. Uh, most of them met with failure, but um, one time uh, during the summer between my sophomore and junior year, uh, we were driving the car and my buddy who's a smoker uh, went out to li light a cigarette and he goes, damn, I always lose my lighter in the car. Um, and then we put two and two together and there, we, there it was, the tight light was born. We didn't really do much with it, messed around with a couple different models, but um, the summer between my junior and senior year, I said, hey, I wanna do this, it's simple enough, big enough market, Let's do this. So I researched online uh, provisional patents, the whole uh, king caboodle there, and I actually drafted my own uh, provisional patent, filed it. So right now, this the tight light is patent pending. However, since then, uh, me and my buddy uh, Jack McAvoy have since split apart. The details of his compensation are in the packet that you all have received, and I can go into that a little bit more uh, later if you'd like. So what is the tight light? It's nothing flashy, so I'm not gonna try and dress it up. It's simply a lighter holder that you can place in any, uh, anywhere you want, anywhere you conveniently smoke. So, how does it work? Step one, peel off the adhesive on the bottom, which is also where the UPC code will go. Step two, stick the tight light anywhere you conveniently smoke. Um, in your car, on your dashboard, under your um, coffee table, on your grill, on your golf bag, if you like to smoke stogies out on the course. Um, and then simply snap your bic in and out. But pictures are worth a thousand words. Why don't we put the product in your hands? Chrissy, could you uh, pass out the prototypes and the judges? I have uh, four different prototypes, so you have to share, but uh, feel free to snap it in, snap it out. It's fully functional. I just ask that you don't uh, stick it anywhere because those are my only four. So uh, now that you've seen the product, let's talk about who we're gonna sell it to. Obviously, main target market, smokers. 43.8 million smokers in the U.S. Uh, as of 2011, 77.8% um, smoke on a daily basis. That's a large market in itself. On top of that, this is re really where the tight light gets its legs. Pr selling the tight light to corporations as promo promotional pieces and bounce backs. Thirdly, just great for general uh, lighter users. Put it next to your charcoal grill. Um, if you use candles, golf bags, like I said. Um, and then we wouldn't specifically target to this market, but an up-and-coming industry is the medical marijuana industry who would also um, use this product and be a potentially very large market. So how are we gonna make money out of this thing? Three revenue strategies. First one, selling it at convenience store point of purchases. Second one, promotional pieces like I said. And then finally, um, a different route would be licensing the product. First, convenience store point of purchases. Where are we gonna put it? right next to the Bic lighters. They're gonna be buying a Bic lighter, they're gonna see the product, and they're gonna go, wow, uh, I need that. Uh, and it's at such a small price point. Uh, packaging, unwrapped in a clear bowl, um, like what she has there. Uh, on the side will be an actual tight light, it'll say, try me. Uh, you can snap it in, out, and on the side it'll say, what happened to your other lighter? Finally, price point. Um, I'm thinking somewhere between the 99 cent and $1.99 price point. Again, this will um, shake out in some more market research. I do have preliminary market research in that packet that you can um, check out as well. So that's the first rev revenue strategy. Second revenue strategy, selling it to companies as, as you can see here, um, there's a mock Marlboro one. A couple of uh, the judges have it. Um, and basically what we do is we go to companies and say, hey, uh, these cost 7.5 cents to make, and they make mini billboards. Uh, advertising is extremely fragmented right now, and firms are looking for non-traditional forms of advertising, and this is a great one. Just get tons of mini billboards in front of a uh, similarly aligned target market. Some examples would be Remington uh, or Anheuser-Busch. Third one, licensing, probably the safest, uh, would be going to 7-Eleven uh, or BIC. 
Basically, there'd be a little bit less revenue per sale, obviously, because they'd be doing all the work. Um, but it could potentially increase the market uh, astronomically, moving into markets like China, India, Europe, where smoking is a lot more prevalent. So that's a, uh, another revenue option. Production. I've actually um, gotten quotes from several suppliers in Asia, and uh, Shenzhen M Legend Technology Co. Uh, gave me the cheapest one. I'll go through the cost right now. Injection mold, $4,300 produces a million units. That's uh, less than half a cent a unit. Then we move into the cost per unit, 6.7 cents, and that includes the polycarbonate piece uh, on the top and then the application and adhesive on the bottom. And then finally, shipping cost per unit, again, less than half a cent. Uh, we're talking pennies here, um, huge margins along every uh, step of the uh, distribution channel. Competition. The only real product out there is the lighter leash. As you can see here, you stick the lighter in, uh, in the holder and then clip it to your belt. Uh, this serves kind of a fundamentally different problem of losing your lighter while going out. Mine is simply a uh, convenient place to store your lighter uh, when you, in places that you commonly smoke. Right now, uh, they retail for $1.67 to $3.99 and they can do custom logos and are also licensing NASCAR right now. Um, but as you can see, it's pretty unattractive. Who wants a lighter hanging from your waist? And uh, it's kind of a negative stigma along with it. So uh, the lighter, light, lighter leash I don't see as uh, much of a threat. Other competition, obviously product and adoption. Um, this is a risky run with any product. Another one is the insurgence of another lighter size. Say um, Bic wants, uh, is seeing a, a drop in their lighter sales. Basically tries to change up their shape so that uh, the tight light doesn't work anymore. This CAD, um, the CAD file that produced these prototypes got whipped up in five minutes, not a problem. We could start production in less than a week. And then finally, and probably the biggest threat, is um, a competitor with the same product. Um, patents, there are things called trolls in the uh, commodity industry where they come in and they say, hey, I know you have a patent, but it's gonna cost you a million dollars and take you three years to defend it, so sue me. Um, and that's really not worth it with a product with uh, this small margins. So he could come in, try to steal the market share, or even Bit could do that. Um, possible defenses, really develop a brand and get in at these convenience stores and um, really evaluate, I mean, uh, establish yourself there. And then the other one is the safe route of licensing, which would protect it uh, on the 7-Eleven shelves, or if you're Bic, they could leverage their um, lighter uh, in the distribution channel. So, financial snapshot. How much money are we gonna make? Right here, uh, this one, 2.3 million, is based on 15 million units sold at a uh, 99 cents pri price point, and then uh, the over 12 million in the first year is Again, 15 million units at $1.99. Um, here we have cost of goods sold. I'll break that down in the next slide. Cost of molds, $4,300 uh, times uh, 15 for each million units. Um, and then selling general admin, maybe if we're trying to get some large accounts like Marlboro, we need to wine and dine them or something like that. But really, it's a small operation. Uh, again, here's this McAvoy compensation, and that would be the extent of it. Uh, I can go through that if you want later. And then, so finally, we're talking large, large um, r revenue and in net income in the first year alone. And then it, it'll continue. So, uh, <laughs> the COGS unit per, uh, broken down, sorry. Uh, as I just said, 6.7 cents per unit. Um, went through that a little earlier. Shipping. And then these next four. It's hard to um, really get a fine-tuned number without actually getting a quote from the distribution channel or the retail. Um, but I did my best estimation uh, based on some research. We got eight cents for import, export, packaging, barcode, four cents, and then 27 cents for uh, the distributor and also the retailer, leaving 26.01 cents for us um, per unit. And that's at the 99 cents price point, but obviously if you go up to $1.99, that uh, skyrockets. So, some things I've done. Uh, I've actually pitched it to Marlboro. Um, you can see a copy of the email. It's the last page in that packet uh, as a promotional piece. Um, pretty good marketing strategy. Uh, I've actually visited BIC headquarters. I've met, uh, I've had various meetings with investors and uh, local entrepreneurs like Karen Adams, who's actually uh, sent me to Daryl Jarvie, who is head of Worth Product Groups, and right now that's my biggest lead. Um, 
It's in the second phase of marketing research there. It passed uh, the first stage of marketing research. You can see all the data in the packet I gave you. Um, okay. um, so hopefully it'll launch in May. Um, if all goes well, it'll launch in May um, and at a, at a trade show. Why invest with the tight light? Simple product for a simple problem, huge market potential and margins. The legwork's been done. I've got the supplier in China. I've got um, the actual prototypes. Um, all I need is a convenience store contact. Let's start making some money and let's start making it fast. I don't need uh, a lot of years to establish a brand. We get the right uh, contact in the 7-Eleven, in the Wawa's, we're gonna make some money. So I'm looking for an investor that's extremely knowledgeable in the convenience store commodity industry. Um, they would be responsible for 40% of the investment. I would be responsible for the remaining 60%. It's not um, a big investment at all. Um, and then I, in exchange, I'm offering 40%. Uh, percent. Thanks a lot for your time. Uh, any questions? That was great. Thank could you, you. Could you maybe go back a few slides yeah. to uh, your uh, financials? Yep. And before the cogs, right here. Yep. Yes. Basically. Yeah. Okay. And yep. that's using the same cards you had in the Correct. Slide. Exact same setup. Just changed um, the uh, the price. Fifty million units times a dollar ninety nine instead of ninety nine cents. It's just um, the margins just skyrocket for uh, us. Okay. And you can see in the marketing research um, the preliminary, which is actually only based on pictures. Um, that 50% of the people, or just, it's a pretty much a 50-50 split between the um, people who would buy it for 99 cents and $1.99. Great job, thank you. Thank you. Um, you. You talked about licensing to Bic or somebody else, so what, what's making that a secondary strategy versus, it sounds like your primary strategy is to distribute this yourself. Right. That's a lot of work, yeah. so why not just let somebody with an established distribution network do all that, do all that heavy lifting for you? Uh, I've got no, I, I don't really know anybody in those, uh, in those places and it's tough to get a meeting. Um, I've tried several times, um, but really I need somebody with a reputation uh, to come in there and maybe represent me. Um, but I'm a small fish right now and I, I actually met with Bic, but um, their legal team is, is pretty, pretty tight so it's tough to get in there. But that would be just great because they'd move it into international markets, which would be huge. David, good job. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, the 15 million units sold at one or the other prices, mm -hmm. I know that you mentioned three different ways that you were planning, on, you know, that you could possibly go. Have you, have you broken that 15 million down into which of those, you know, how, what percentage in each of those areas you feel like you're going to go or? I haven't. Is it just 15 million and you're praying that it falls into one of those three areas? Well, I think that um, the market is around 80 million, possibly 80 to 100 million based on the smokers um, and potential um, companies to pick this up for large bulk orders and also uh, the medical marijuana industry and general lighter users. Um, so I basically took a certain percentage of that. Um, I didn't really count in uh, the specific uh, distribution of each. But I think that um, is possible because I have a plan obsolescence of six months for the adhesive, so it could potentially uh, result in repeat purchases. And then the other thing, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned just very quickly uh, that a lot of people in other countries may smoke more than people here in America. I'm just curious of the 15, if 15 million or you know your projections, um, what percentage of that do you feel like that's going to be here versus in other places where you, you might find smoking more um, readily accepted? Uh, this is just domestic. I had 15 million just domestically. Uh, if it moves internationally, um, that would be a much larger number. Um, if they got into the 7-Eleven's point of purchase. The, um, the people I actually got a quote from um, in China was like, when you uh, produce these, can I buy one? So, um, already some interest. Thank you. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh yeah, thank you.
This thing's all awkward, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Nice job. Thank you. Good. Okay. All right, good evening and welcome. My name is Sergio Angelis. This is Frederick Anderson, and we're very excited to introduce Ubrew, for which we are seeking $30,000. So every day, you ask yourself this very simple question. What should I drink? And as you can see, beer is often the answer. In fact, beer is so often the answer that Americans on average consume 22 gallons of beer per person per year. However, what you like, Sergio, might not be the same beer that I prefer. That's right, Frederick. And that's why we created Ubrew, your own personal brewery. Ubrew is something we created because we saw some problems in the marketplace. For example, we feel like there are not enough, um, there's not enough creativity in the marketplace. When you go and buy uh, a coffee at Starbucks, you can choose exactly how you want your coffee to be created. Why can't you do that with beer? When um, uh, we feel like you should have full control over the ingredients and the brewing process. You know exactly what goes into your beer can. And we also feel like there's not enough education in the market. So when you walk down a beer aisle, you might know, not know exactly what a beer is going to taste like before you have sampled it. In short, we don't think that beer is personalized enough. So our solution to this is Ubrew. We want to create personalized small batches where we give the consumer full control over the brewing process and the ingredients and where we leave you, where we guide you throughout the entire buying process. So how much would this cost you? Well, one uh, case of 24 bottles would be $99, or two cases of 48 for $149, plus shipping. And this is something you'd pay upfront when you're ordering on our website. So how exactly does the U-Brew process work? Well, you would go online, and you'd first begin by picking your beer base, then the style and the flavors. Throughout these first three steps, we'll give you recommendations guidance and education so you'll know exactly what you're doing along the way afterwards you'll be able to name your beer and design your label we then brew the beer for you and send you photo updates along the way then after two to six weeks we'll ship the beer directly to your house so obviously it's really important that you like the beer that you buy from us so we want to have something what we call an online brewmaster service so when you log on to our website you answer some simple questions to so we can understand what kind of beer you like for example, maybe what kind of beer do you normally drink? And then we narrow down the results so you get something similar to that. We also want to give you a basic overview of the beer styles that we have available. So if you know a little bit more about beer, then you can narrow it down yourself. We want to give you recommendations of ingredients that work well together so that you get a beer that tastes really good. And if there's something that does not work very well together, we'll give you a warning on the website that you're about to head down a bad path. Um, we also envision having an online community on our website where you can share recipes and successful brews that you've done with other people who are you brewers. So we went ahead and we created a really rough uh, mock-up of what the website might look like. And uh, just to give you a better understanding of the process. So as you can see, we start off by uh, selecting a beer base. You'd be giving two, light or dark, and then some sort of educational aspect. So I'm a big fan of light beer, so let's go with that one. Next, you'll be given uh, beer styles, and here you'll uh, select from a diagram of different styles, such as American Pale Ale, et cetera, et cetera, and then you'll also be given their accompanying flavor profile. So I'm a big fan of the Pale Ales because of their hoppy and malty taste, so let's go that way. Next, you'll be able to choose your beer flavors. Uh, here we're only showing hops, but essentially you'll be given a list of hops here on the left side, followed by their flavor uh, taste. And then on the right side, you'll be able to choose how many of those hops you want in ounces. So this will be done for grain and yeast as that is what contributes to the flavor in beer. 
And lastly, we'll, you'll be able to name your beer and create a logo via our online logo creator tool. So switching track, Ubrew will be in the beer industry, which currently sits at $27.3 billion. But more importantly, we will be in the craft beer segment, which is $3.2 billion. More importantly, this uh, segment is expected to grow 9% annually from 2013 to 2017. So as Sergio mentioned, we will be in the craft beer segment. So we went ahead and looked at the typical demographics of a craft beer buyer. Normally it's a 21 to 45 year old white male with a college education earning up uh, $50,000 per year or more. We also think that we, will, um, uh, that we will additionally sell to people who are really interested in learning about the brewing process and how, how to create a beer, the people who really like beer and people who are time constrained. They want to brew beer at home, but they simply do not have the time to do so. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about our marketing strategy. Um, we want to have an online presses on Facebook and on Twitter. We also want to use targeted online advertising so we can really focus on that target market that we've identified. For that, we want to use search engines and social media, such as Google and Facebook. We also want to use traditional advertising. And by that, we mean um, homebrewing magazines, and having a uh, presence at beer expos and beer festivals. So now you might wonder a little bit about our competition. So we went ahead and created a competitor comparison matrix that you can see here. In the left hand um, column you have Ubrew. In the middle we have a beer on premise, brew on premises brewery, which means that you as a consumer physically go to a brewery and use their equipment to brew. And then on the right hand side we have a home brewing kit. Now clearly, as you can see, for the factors we have chosen, Ubrew is the clear choice and the winner. I just want to tell you a little bit about what I think is really important here. And that is that, for example, we guide our customers throughout the entire process. We have the ability to create really small batches. So you don't need to buy a really large batch if you don't want to. We can design custom labels for you. There is no um, initial investment required. So you don't have to buy anything because we own everything. We own the equipment. And finally, our cost to brew is much lower than for our competitors. So let's look at our financial projections. In year one, we anticipate to be brewing five batches of beer per week throughout the year, and that nets us 35,000. Our expenses sit at 51,000, 13 of which are startup costs, 10 go to just equipment, 3,000 go to ingredients, which nets us a negative 29,000. By year two, we anticipate to be brewing 10 batches of beer per week throughout the year, and that nets us a profitable uh, 8,700 for year two. By year three, we anticipate to be going, uh, shipping our beer nationally, and we anticipate to be brewing 25 batches of beer per week throughout the year. That nets us 178,000 in sales, leaving us with 38,000 in net income. So one of the numbers you may be wondering why it's so high is our gross profit, given the fact that we have such a high level of customization. Well, we ran a cost simulation about 10,000 times, mixing and matching different ingredients to better understand how much it would cost us to brew a batch of beer. And as you can see, the max that it costs us to just brew one case is $30, and two cases only $61, leaving us with at least 100% margin on our product. So scalability and future growth is very important. So we came up with three different ideas. One, we want to start an online reservation system where you can go online and pick a time that we will guarantee we will brew your beer on that specific day. Next, we want to adjust the manufacturing process. We'll do this by buying a 32 to 64 gallon drum, and we'll start by brewing the first step, that base there, and then distributing it into the smaller batches. And lastly, we want to expand into catering and brewing for private events. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our management team. Sergio here is going to be you, Bruce, uh, COO and CEO. He has two years of home brewing experience back home in Colorado, and he's an international business major. I'm going to be Ubrew CFO and CMO. I have experience in warehousing and customer service, and I am a management and marketing concentration. So what's the current status on Ubrew? Well, we've completed several milestones already. We have conducted our feasibility analysis and got a lot of great feedback. We actually have about 10 potential customers already, and I'm sure we have more right now. Um, we have also obtained uh, confidential wholesale pricing, and all that is reflected in the financial projections. We have also found potential brewing sites in and around the Richmond area. So our current steps are to build and design the website, as that is crucial for Ubrew. We also need to investigate and find out more about shipping beer across state lines, as that's key into growing. And also we need to file as an LLC. So 
Before we take some of the questions, we created some mock-up designs of what the beer bottles might potentially look like. So I'm going to hand them out for you here. Here's an example of what it might look like if you're doing a birthday party. We're also thinking maybe you want to do a corporate event. Um, if you don't want to design the labels yourself, that's kind of how a basic label would look like. This is if you want to do like maybe um, uh, if you're getting engaged or something like that. Um, if uh, you want to do a school event or a Greek life event. Any questions? All right, thank you for the defective bottles. Yeah, we've they're, drank They're it empty. Before, so. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, have you guys thought about or have you approached this from a, a lean basis where you've already started to production? Seems like something that you could do with minimal investment to really test the market with actual product as opposed to projections. Uh, and also, have you done local research? Richmond's a very strong craft beer town. There was just a big craft festival yesterday, right. in fact. So have you guys done some on the ground research as well? Yeah, so we, I mean, I've been, we actually, I've been brewing here on campus too. And we have, <laughs> don't tell anyone, but we, <laughs> we have had some interest of people who want to buy from us. So, I mean, I can test it simply just by brewing at home and selling the beer directly to you if you want. And so, as regard, in regards to your other question, we haven't found any other competitor that does this, more specifically here in Richmond. The only thing, the closest that we found are those brew on premises, but those are in Washington and Oregon. There's even one in Australia, but they don't ship. But other than that, we just we know that there are other microbreweries here that are starting as well. So those would also be your competitors. But other than that, we there's nothing else quite like you, bro. What is the value of a customer? What is the value of a customer? I mean, to us, the customer is essentially key, but. We, and we obviously have to do our best to try to keep them because customers are what will drive Ubrew. If the customer doesn't like the product, then they will obviously not come back. And we want to offer obviously high quality and the best taste that you can get. And that's why we are offering the other you know, ways to make you get the beer that you want. Are there any monetary projections on the value of a customer though? I mean, a, a typical customer drinks, you know, as we mentioned, 22 gallons of beer. Most of them are starting to move into craft beer, which costs 10 bucks for a standard six pack. So, I mean, we can project that a standard customer might be worth to us a couple thousand dollars. Thank you. Just one, obviously, in, in the state. Yeah. Don't spill the beer. Good job, guys. I, I had the sense as I listened to you that you're underestimating the complexity of fulfilling on customized orders. So how would you respond to kind of my sense of that? So in terms of the logistical? Or, so, oh, if you want. No, go ahead. Um, so we'll essentially start by, we have a, our initial machine that we can brew three to four batches in eight hours. So we'll start by brewing our base. So if you select the light base, we're using two-row malt and that's essentially in the same batch. So after that, the grains that you select, that's what we're steeping, and that's the customization aspect of it, that we have standardized the process to use certain times that are within the industry, and that's essentially how we're gonna do it. Um, so once we are able to expand, and we want to buy that 64 gallon drum, and that's where we can brew a big batch of that initial base, and then distribute it into the smaller batches so we can do up to eight at once as opposed to just three. So I don't know if that was clear, but um, every batch takes about three hours for us, and that's how we projected the number of brews we're doing per day. So we're allocating three hours per brew, and then obviously they're fermenting for two to six weeks, but that's, then we don't have to do anything. Just wait. I'm wondering, it's, it's kind of um, expensive, I think, for some people to buy 24 or 48, which is the only two you mentioned that um, you were a little bit flexible in how much you can buy. I mean, for some people who like craft beer, they might not want to buy 24 for $99. I'm just curious, I know you're making them in bigger batches, but I'm just curious what the reasoning was behind 
um, the 24 and the 48, and if you think that that will change in any way so that your market can expand, because I, th I think, I don't know how difficult it is to brew beer, but I just think that maybe you might be limiting some customers by requiring that big of a batch. Um, one of the reasons why we chose 24 and 48 was because we were thinking if it takes two to six weeks and they have to wait that long, then maybe they want a larger order than just 12 bottles or six. Yeah, in addition, a normal, a standard batch of beer is five gallons. So it's, it's harder for us to brew two and a half gallons just because we have, it's not easy to just cut the, you know, the process in half. So for us, I mean, that's the least that we can go. I don't want to offer less amount of bottles, but we want to expand further in that we can start brewing 15 gallon, 32 gallons, and that is what we'll, what we will sell to the private events once we get to year three. Sure. I think you did a good job. I think events and bigger things are really what your target's going to need to be. I don't think you're going to find um, a lot of onesie twosies unless they really enjoy good beer. <laughs> You guys did a great job. My question was about packaging as well. Have you considered uh, larger packaging? Uh, home brewers, five gallon standard, uh, five gallons, pony kegs, is that something that you'd contemplated? We did, we did uh, think about it, but um, <laughs> it's actually easier for us to send bottles. So we have all the pack packaging already set up uh, and we will be shipping through FedEx as that's the only carry that we can uh, within Virginia. But it's lighter and it's cheaper for us to buy bottles rather than a bunch of kegs uh, and storing it because we also have to ferment and carbonize the product and that would be cheaper for us to do and then just ship it out. And then you also deal with if you send the keg, one if they don't have any type of keg equipment at home. So, but for events, that might be something that we will look into. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. A little bit higher. Yeah, the drink you put in your pocket and the glass. Hmm? Yep. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Nice. Yeah, they can hear you. Yeah. 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 All right, let's go. So he's 
easy, right? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Rogers, and this is my business partner, Boris Fedorov. And this afternoon, we're excited to, to present our idea of four players. Early last year, Boris and I discussed the fact that many of our peers spend hours a week playing some form of PC or video game, a task that many consider an unproductive use of time. What we realized, though, is that to these individuals, and the roughly half a billion others like them, the roughly eight hours a week that they, they spend playing these video games is not only a viable option to spend their time, but an important part of their everyday lives. We also realized, though, that there were some glaring problems with the process that gamers often experience while gaming. This sentiment was echoed by a focus group that we conducted on the University of Richmond and by extensive research. The first of these problems is that there's a, an incredible opportunity cost associated with gaming. This opportunity cost manifests itself in two ways, time and money. Becoming good at gaming requires an abundance of time, hours that gamers and outsiders alike often feel could be used for some other societal benefit or overall productive value. Secondly, uh, gaming requires a lot of money to play over time, and gamers often receive nothing in return. This leads to the second point, and that is that uh, gamers spend hours honing their skills and perfecting their craft, but there's no frequent or consistent reward that they receive in return. Finally, and most relevant to our product, is the fact that there are physical gaming tournaments that exist in an, in an attempt to solve the above two problems. The issue with these tournaments, however, is that they're infrequent, they're scattered around the world, and they're physical in nature, meaning they require a physical location to be played at. Um, so the average gamer doesn't have access to these tournaments. So what is 4Players? Four 4Players four is a productive solution that helps proud players turn passion into profits. We act as, a, as an online game tournament facilitator, allowing players of various skill levels to be able to make some money playing their favorite video game. So we create value for skilled players in the way that we turn wasted time into valuable, profitable time. So um, as opposed to the scattered tournaments, that rare and scattered tournaments that Michael talked about, we provide unlimited tournaments at any time, at any place, uh, via our online uh, centralized platform. So how does it work? First, our users will have to create an account on our website. Then they will have to make a deposit using any kind of payment method of a choice. And third, as soon as they have some money in their account, they will be able to create and join a tournament that matches their preferences. So it can be the game they want to play, the time they want to play, and the entrance price they're willing to pay for. So as soon as they, as, as they register for tournaments, they will go online, compete, and if they win, they will receive the money straight to their account. So for example, if four players register for tournaments, 
and the entrance price is ten dollars. The winner of the tournament will make thirty-six dollars and will have a four dollars profit. The question then arises: Where can we implement such a service? South Korea is the gaming capital of the world. In fact, about 35% of South Koreans play some form of video game or PC game on a weekly basis. That amounts to 17 million people playing games every week. In addition, South Korea is the most connected country in the world in terms of internet speed and overall access. This is shown by the country's 26,000 internet cafes, which are frequented by 80% of our target audience. In South Korea, gaming is not just a hobby, but it's a lifestyle. Think of gaming in South Korea like the phenomenon of the NFL in America. All of these above points go to show uh, one very specific point that, that we believe is our strongest advantage. We have a very specific target customer. That is a South Korean male between the ages of 18 and 40 years old that frequents these internet cafes between the hours of 8 and 12 in the evening and plays over 8 hours of games per week. Also an important point here is that gamers are already willing to pay for the games that they're playing. When they go to the internet cafes, they have to pay anywhere between a dollar and a dollar fifty uh, per hour to play these games. Uh, finally, this is our, our target market right now. However, our global potential um, will allow us to expand this target market as we continue. Our competitive landscape includes only two competitors so far: um, Virgin Gaming and Gamer Saloon. These two websites were launched two years ago in the U.S. and target mostly American gamers and more specifically, console gamers. Whereas our service target the Asian, Asian market, and more specifically, PC gamers. So we plan to build some strong exclusive partnerships with a selected um, group of internet cafes chains that will help us um, establish strong barriers to entry for future competitors. Um, secondly, we plan to use our first mover advantage in this market by, by providing quality service from the start, we believe that it will create strong um, customer loyalty and increase uh, customer retention. Um, and finally, we also incorporated the whole community aspect in our platform that allows, that allows um, our users to increase their social interactions by uh, using our dynamic forum, chat, and group system that are already implemented in our website. In Sorry, go ahead. In addition, we also plan to um, develop a mobile application that will create ease of use for our users. So to reach our target, our, our target market, we plan to use a multifaceted marketing strategy, the first of which is by using player endorsements. As I said before, gaming in South Korea is really a culture, and the professional gamers are the heart of this gaming culture. Professional gamers in South Korea earn between three dollars and $400,000 per year, and they have upwards of a million fan followers. So here we plan to play into the idea of aspirational groups, or those individuals who admire or aspire to be like their favorite gamer. Uh, it's widely understood that the individual at the top of this aspirational group has great influence over those that follow him or her. Secondly, we will, Boris mentioned the internet cafes that we'll have uh, exclusive partnerships with, and we plan to strategically market in a select group of these internet cafes by offering them a 2% commission of any uh, funds that come into them. Uh, therefore, giving them incentive to uh, promote our product. Uh, in essence, the internet cafes are the vehicle that we reach our target audience by. Thirdly, and least importantly, we'll use social media to reach our target market. Uh, we realize that in today's world, it's, it's foolish, especially with individuals between 18 and 40, to overlook uh, social media advertising, especially since it's very cost effective. So we're also going to use this uh, form of advertising, though not as important as the first two elements. Uh, these elements combined, we hope, will have a viral outcome. Remember that I said South Korea is the most connected country in the world, so it's not inconceivable that our product will spread uh, virally. We're not, however, relying on this viral outcome to reach our target audience. So here's a, a, a financial projection for the next five years. Um, it is important to, needs, to notice that given a $200,000 investment at the beginning of year one, we'll uh, break even within the same year. Um, our payback period is 2.25 years. So our users will grow from 3,000 at the end of the first year to 40,000 at the end of the fifth year, uh, making a profit of $1.4 million. Um, to come up with these numbers, we had to, ma to make several key assumptions. Um, and for all these assumptions, we stayed really conservative, as you can see in this table right there. Um, so for example, we assumed that the average gamer will be um, interested in spending only $1 to participate in a tournament, whereas in reality, we think that 
the average gamer will spend from 10 to $15 to be able to participate in the tournament. So here's a quick overview of our team. Isabel Pierre, who is an entrepreneur, um, she's our business guidance and also our initial investor. Michael Rogers, in charge of our marketing strategies. Myself, responsible for management and financials of business. We actually have a um, tech team who are subcontractors. And finally, Mr. Gary Koo, who is a South Korean business consultant and our cultural guidance. So what have we done so far? In the summer of 2012, we assembled our initial team. From there, we obtained $20,000, of which we've used the bulk to uh, invest in our website. Our website is at almost full functionality right now. We're just working on making it uh, aesthetically pleasing to the South Korean audience. We added additional members earlier this month, and we hope to have our beta testing completed by June of 2013. From there, we hope to sign our partnership agreements in the summer of 2013 and launch by the fall of, 20, of 2013. And we mentioned a bit before about expansion. We plan to expand within the Asian Pacific region uh, by 2014 and eventually to Europe by 2015. Uh, we thank you for your attention and we're happy to receive any questions. Good job, guys. Enjoyed it again right. from thank last you. week. Um, quick question on the partnerships with the Internet Cafes. Right. Uh, I think you mentioned you would pay them 2% yep. of the fees. Um, can you elaborate a little bit how you came up with that and as you think about barriers to entry and another competitor coming in at 3, 4, 5 percent um, and how to really keep those exclusive to you? Okay, so um, yeah, 2 percent we feel is a substantial amount for um, the internet cafes because the important thing to note is that the gamers are already coming to these internet cafes to play. Um, so we needed to provide them with, with some additional incentive for them to promote our product. Um, so the 2% comes out to, I, I think it's about $200,000 per year um, for a set of, of internet cafes. And um, of course, if, if other competitors did come in and increase that rate, we would also be willing to, to increase our, our rate as well. But we, we do feel that that's a significant amount, at least initially. R remember too that this isn't being done in South Korea right now. So it, it's a new market. and um, and, and we're the first movers there, so we do feel that we have a, a strategic advantage in that light. Right, and that's why we are trying to uh, send some, some long-term contracts with these internet cafes since we have the first win in the market. They will only benefit from this um, platform. Thanks. I'm just curious about your relationship with Gary, the fellow in South Korea so, who's helping right. you out and what direction mm -hmm. you feel like he's providing that you feel is going to... Um, help you make the right moves, right. especially in a place that's so far away, mm -hmm. in a culture that's so different. Um, what is it that you're, that you're doing to make so, sure? So um, I've been in touch with uh, Gary two weeks ago through uh, LinkedIn. She, uh, he is acting as a connector, like he says, in, uh, for um, business startups in South Korea. So he helps companies reaching and uh, being in contact with each other. So that's how I reached him on LinkedIn. And we're actually right now etching some uh, inboxes. LinkedIn. And so, since we are planning to go to South Korea this summer, we are possibly planning to meet with him and to talk like further about uh, what can he bring us and what can, he, can, what can we bring him. And then one, one quick question. You said you had $20,000 and you spent it mainly on building your website. Yeah. And I saw the um, company that's doing that for you. Are you, is, are you partnering with them? Because it seems to me that you're going to have a lot of web overhead. Somebody trying to you know, manage bringing on, right. I don't know, when you have additional games and all that traffic and security mm -hmm. and things like that. Are you thinking about a partnership in the technology space? Or are you going to continue to pay somebody to help yeah. you with that? Actually, um, they say working on uh, our platform uh, for four months ago. So 20,000 20, was the price of a platform. So we already paid them that, this amount. Um, but the, the, the owner of A Distance, which is the tech team, showed a lot of interest in the, in the idea. So we, we didn't do anything right now. We didn't sign any contracts. But uh, there is a high possibility that we, we have a, a relationship with them, a partnership, so that they can maintain, maintain the website, you know and uh, they, we will become some partners, yeah. 
Thank you guys for a nice job. Uh, uh, if this doesn't get off the ground the way you anticipate that it will, what's the most likely culprit? The most likely culprit? Um, probably just the fact that uh, it, it, it's, we're dealing with a culture that um, we're not as familiar with, and so we're aware of that. That is an obstacle for us. Um, but we feel that we've done a lot of research and we're trying to make connections within South Korea um, in order to feel more confident uh, working within the country. So I, I think if, if it doesn't take off, which, which I strongly believe it will, um, it'll, it'll probably be because we don't have experience within another culture, honestly, yeah. And um, I think the, this product is actually a solution for all these uh, gamers. They just don't have a possibility right now to, to have these elements in their life. So I think the key, the key element in our strategy is uh, the marketing. Because if, if they are aware of this product, of the existence of this product, um, for me, I'm 100% sure that they will use it. Because, I mean, as Michael said before, it's already part of a lifetime, li lifestyle, sorry. And along those lines, guys, how, how are you? It sounds like you're going to go big, which is to kind of put everything in place, go to South Korea, sign a licensing deal, and all is good, right? Mm -hmm. If I was in their shoes, I'd be hard pressed to do that with an untested concept or product. How are you going to test us on a small basis to really make sure it works and it's scalable? That's what I'm curious about. Are you going to do it small or are you going to put all your eggs into getting a licensing deal? Well, the company is based in Monaco right now and, um, and Boris is actually from Monaco. And so we're going to launch our beta testing uh, within Monaco uh, with a small group of individuals, 80 to 100 individuals to ensure that the, the product does work well and um, they can address any problems that the product has. And moving forward, then, we can implement it within South Korea because the worst thing we would want to do is, is go into South Korea and, and have a, a product that's not functioning uh, to full capacity. And um, the reason why we, cho we, why we chose South Korea is because it's the ideal market for us and it's probably the less risky one. So by going there and by actually, you say we'll just go there and you know, we'll, we'll try, we'll give it a try, but we will actually plan to, uh, to build and to maybe spend uh, quite a time making some good relationships, some strong relationship over there. Do you have any understanding of the regulatory and internet compliance within South Korea? Yeah, and th this is a question that uh, a lot of people have, have asked us in, in the past. The difference between, between our service and a betting service, which a lot of people um, often think our service is, is the fact that these individuals are playing a game of skill and not a game of chance. And so um, it's not a gambling service, but rather they're, they're betting on their own skill. They have complete control or relative complete control over the outcome of the game. And so it is legal um, in South Korea as well as the, the other markets we plan to expand to. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Ça va, Jalil Thanks, man. Ça va, toi C'est vrai C'est vrai C'est vrai. Ouais, ouais, bah oui. All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, or good evening. My name is Esteban Hernandez, and my company's called iFixItFast, and I'm looking for a $50,000 investment in exchange for equity. 
So say you broke your iPhone and you're looking to fix it. What are your options? Well, you could go to the Apple store and file your $200 deductible. You could mail in your iPhone. Or you could physically drive to a mom and pop computer repair store. If none of these options satisfy you, there is a real problem. What is the solution? You can do nothing. That's right, nothing, except let iFixitFast come to you. iFixitFast is a mobile iPhone repair service. We employ mobile technicians that service you at your home and or office. So how does it work? Simply call toll-free at our 1-800 number and schedule your mobile repair. Wait patiently for a technician to arrive. And once the repair is complete, simply pay, make payment on the spot. It's that easy. Here's a snapshot of the market. This is in your handout. So, oh, I'm sorry. Americans have spent over $5.9 billion repairing their iPhones. It's $100 million more what Obama and Romney spent on their last campaign. It's 15 times more what Americans spent on contraceptives. And it's twice what Americans spent on toilet paper. 30% of iPhone owners have experienced accidental damage within 12 months of owning their device. Accidental damage is 10 times more common than theft and or loss. And due to the, the cost of these repairs, 6% have actually taped their phone and 11% have actually gone with a broken screen. So in order that, to address this issue, I'm going to talk about my business model. And three things that I want to mention is how do we make money, where is our target market, and what are our gross margins? So in terms of how do we make money, we sell services, mainly iPhone repair, iPad repair, and iPod, iPod repair. Our target market, half of them are between the ages of 20 and 34, and the other half are between the ages of 34 and 55. Our primary customers are AT&T and Verizon stores. Secondary customers are college and graduate students. We also have um, corporate clients, so Virginia Capital Partners and Marriott Hotels. Our gross margins, we make roughly $40 on iPhone repair, $100 on iPad repair, and $70 on iPod repair. And this is a breakdown of the gross margin for the iPhone 4 and the 4S. So as I said before, we start $70. Our cost of goods sold, including shipping with China, is $24. And that's the average gas cost for an average trip, which is 10 miles. And so that's where we got that $40 margin from. In terms of our competitive advantage, this is what our supply chain used to look like. So our customer was buying from iFixitFast, and iFixitFast has to buy inventory from a wholesale distributor, who in turn was buying inventory from a trading company, and in turn was buying the inventory from a factory. That means that we had to charge our customer very high prices because we were buying at very high inventory prices. This is what our supply chain looks like today. We source directly from a factory in Shenzhen. It's right next to the factory formerly known as Foxconn. Um, and this has allowed us to be able to price very competitively. We are able to negotiate minimum order quantities of 10 or less. So this allowed us to be very lean uh, and also allows us to have a large customer base in Richmond. Moving on to our marketing. So as you can see from your handout, I currently rank second uh, in Google Maps under the search listing for iPhone repair. I also rank on the first page for the Google search for iFixit. iFixit is a it's a website where like, you can fix anything. It's got guides, videos, and it has, according to Alexa, about 100,000 unique visitors per month. With the $50,000 investment, I want to advertise on a billboard. So we talked to Landmar, and there's a billboard that's on Main and 3rd. It's, it's 14 by 48 feet. Uh, the cost per month is about $2,500. Those are the monthly uh, those are the weekly impressions. Those are new impressions. So it's about 49,000 people that see the billboard. And these are conversion rates I got from Landmar. Uh, these are very conservative conversion rates. Those are, those are weekly numbers. So in order for us to break even with the billboard, we would need to repair 30 iPhones. And so as you can see, even with those really modest numbers, like we will still make it more than you know, the cost of the billboard. So. Uh, this is what the billboard looks like today. It's, that's on Main and 3rd. This is a mock-up of what it would look like if like, we put our sign on there. <laughs> In terms of sales, so 30% of our sales actually come from AT&T and Verizon stores. Our cost per acquisition from these stores is zero. They just recommend clients to us. We've developed relationships with them. 10% uh, of them come from Google Maps. So if you go on your iPhone, you go on Google Maps, and you put iPhone repair, we come up second. So that cost per acquisition is zero. 
Uh, and also customer referrals is zero. Well, it is now. And 50%, we estimate, will come from the billboard. So that cost would be, well, you have 49,000 per week, so it's about 200,000 people that see the advertising per month. You divide it by the cost, which is 2,500. So it's about two or three cents per, per visitor or something like that. Here are competitors, Albatech and First and Main. They're located in the Shaco Bottom and VCU area. Their business is mainly computer repair, but they also do iPhone repair. Cell phone technicians and Richmond Geeks, they're more in the Henrico and Shore, and Shore Pump area. Uh, Richmond Geeks does mostly computer repair, but they also do iPhone repair and iPad repair. Uh, and they're also, they also price competitively. And cell phone technicians just does cell phones and uh, iPhones, and, and they're located in, in the Shore Pump area. There's a price comparison of my prices in comparison to theirs. Since they're all brick and mortar stores and I'm mobile, they have to pay utilities, and so they have to charge $99 for iPhone repair, whereas I can charge $69. Uh, and I'm also really competitive on the iPhone 5. Okay, so let's talk about our management. Currently, I'm the founder and CEO of iFixit Fast. I have experience with sourcing from China through Alibaba. Our CEO is Armand Medirian. He's working with ING Bank. Uh, Jordan is our CFO. He is working with KPMG. Uh, our chief marketing officer is Yichi Zhang. He is fluent in Mandarin, uh, and he's got experience with import and export as well. And our chief technical officer is Mike Orstiani. He is the founder of Lucyphone, currently resides in downtown Richmond, and he's a Stanford grad uh, and has a background in comp sci and electrical engineering. So here are our financials. Uh, this, this is the handout you have. So we started the company in September. We invested $5,000. And in the first month, we made $1,400 in sales. Uh, that, that $700 that you see there is, is 10 iPhones multiplied by 70, which is the cost, which is the, 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 the price of the repair. Uh, we continued with that through November and January. We doubled sales to $1,400. And then February and March, we doubled sales again to $2,800. And that range then transferred again to $3,500. At that point, we were doing 100 phones per month. Uh, and here is where... It gets interesting with the investment. Um, so with the investment, we're able now to purchase inventory for the iPhone 5, for the iPad 2, and the iPod 4. Uh, and we're also able to hire two technicians. Uh, their salaries are at our $1,600 per month. And so that's the 2,800 you see there. And we're also able to lease uh, smart cars for them to, to use with, with their repair. Here's my current status. Uh, I fix it fast as an LLC in Virginia. Uh, our current trademarks are I Fix It Fast, the screw sheet, which you have, which I handed out. It's our proprietary training system. We also have trademarked iGenius, which is what we call our techs. Uh, we have the website up and running. It's powered by Volusion, and it's got secured shopping with VeriSign. And we already have probably, we already have 250 iPhones in Richmond and counting. Uh, lastly, I want to get into my timeline. So I want to take a trip to China with Yi Chi and visit all the factories. I also want to attend the, the famous Canton Fair, just a huge electronics fair in Shenzhen and Guangzhou. We want to introduce a new line of products. So these are the main players overall in the market, Samsung, HTC, and LG. Uh, and we also want to start fixing MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs, as well as iMac and desktops. And lastly, we want to try to expand. So we chose Blacksburg as our first because it's got like the, the highest student ratio for the population and it's home to Virginia Tech, uh, as well as Washington, D.C. and Raleigh because it's got the fourth largest um, population of graduate students and it's also home to UNC and NC State. Thank you very much and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thanks, that was a great presentation. You're uh, I'd have a, it's kind of nagging me about the fensibility of your supply chain. It's yes. a great supply chain. Can everyone else just do it too? No. There is, there is a, a, there's a lot of corruption in China. So I've, I've, I started dealing with, it's, it's, not, it's not to say that, that it's a bad thing. It's just, I was dealing in the beginning with a trading company. And I, I, I thought that I was never really dealing with, with the main guy. So there's, they're, 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 I wasn't getting the best prices. 
Uh, I think a lot of these shops are buying from trading companies, and they don't know they're trading companies because they, don't, they haven't visited. And so, yeah, I think um, it's very hard to actually find a factory that's authorized by Apple in Shenzhen that has very low prices and really high quality. I think default rates for these parts is a huge issue. I, I've encountered a lot of defaulty parts. I thought that was excellent. I, um, I have a question about why you want a billboard um, of, of anything. You want to spend a, f a flat rate every month. It's for, you, it was impressions, right? And there's a percentage of that. But they, people driving by your billboard may or may not be the market that you have. Also, um, I mean, Facebook ads, you can, you can invest in them. I mean, you don't pay unless they click through. So you can have 3 million impressions, spend 500 bucks, and be able to target people, you know, immediately. They could click through, call you. It just seems to me that a billboard, although you're, it was really pretty on the screen, um, it might not, I mean, I'm just curious why you chose that over yes. some other options. Also, um, do you just do broken screens, or do you troubleshoot everything? Yes, so I, I, I couldn't put it up there, but we do everything. So we do iPad, we do battery repair, we do headphone jack repair, we do uh, loudspeaker repair. The only thing we don't repair is the motherboard. Uh, and your first question, the cost to reach 1,000 people with billboards is very, very low. It's about $3. In comparison to a radio advertisement or a, you said a Facebook campaign, I, I think a yeah, Facebook campaign is great, but I think it's like ephemeral. Like it, you do it and then it like disappears. Whereas a billboard, like it's stationary and it's like always there and it's, it's positioned just next to first and main, which will be like right on top of them because they're like, they're like the big guys in Richmond. And so the positioning of that billboard is just, it's, it's very, it's keen to attract a lot of people. Thank you. You're welcome. You mentioned the training sheet is proprietary? Yes. Any way to capitalize on this? Yes, so I actually thought about selling them on the website. I've had shops that, that want to buy them for their shops to train their people. So the, the, the design is copyrighted. Um, there is one other company that has a similar product and currently sells it online on their website for people that want to do it yourself. So. There is that section of the market. There are people that do want to fix their phones themselves, and this would be a great tool for them to possibly do that. Thanks. Welcome. Now, remind, remind me again who your, you had one slide that had your target customers, I think AT&T? Yes. Was listed there, correct? Yeah, I think I can go back to this. And, and I, I've, got, I've got to agree with, with Casey 100%. A billboard, really? To reach those guys, I like the idea to, to not wrap around just impressions, but really go after the right people. So I would encourage you to take a hard look at that particular marketing strategy, because there's a lot of money going into that, versus can I get directly to AT&T and Verizon stores, for example, and deepen the relationship? Can I get a list of all iPhone, iPad owners in Richmond, Virginia, which you can't, right. and market directly to them as opposed to more of a broad base or more of a scatter shot. Yes. Uh, so if, if I were to invest, for example, I would not allow you to invest in a billboard. Right. For example. So I would encourage you to take a look at different marketing strategies, okay. although I love the idea. I felt I just felt like the cost to reach a thousand people with outdoor advertising is some of the lowest out of the other alternatives. And it it just like seemed to me that other ad, other forms maybe are more like I said, ephemeral, like they go and like you do a Facebook advertisement and like what if like people don't see it and they don't spend all that money? Whereas like the billboard is like always stationary, but yeah, I, I, very, I see what you're saying. Um, thank you so much. I guess I'm a little confused as I, I guess understand why we're sourcing from China. At what point does it make sense to spend all of that money, invest all of that money to create relationships in China? I mean, at what point do you break even on that investment versus sales? And what do you, do you need to enter your new markets to do so? Great question. Um, I Skype with my, my, my her name is, her, his name is Sam. So we Skype together. Um, 
he ships through DHL. Uh, since it's a factory, we can only wire transfer the money. They don't take uh, Western Union or anything else. Uh, and essentially, the, the shipping cost is actually really cheap with DHL Express. Um, why, why deal with China? I think because if we want to continue pricing at $70, we need to find the lowest prices. Uh, I could potentially buy it from distributors in the US, but then I would have to raise my prices. So I think it's a matter of, of sustaining that competitive advantage by pricing very competitively. Which leads me to another question, if yes. you don't mind. Um, you are priced about $30 lower than competition yes. for what seems to be the most frequent repair, but yet you also are selling you know, convenience. So you know, would it be worth raising your costs to make more money? Or why, why are we strategically priced so, at $30 less? So the reason how I met um, Mike is because he actually wanted me to charge him more for an express service. So he was thinking about like, well, maybe we could price differentiate if like someone wanted to have their phone fixed within the next half hour, charge them $99. And if you were more comfortable with getting your phones fixed within the next 48 hours, then maybe we'll charge you $70. So I guess that there is that, that option to, to price discriminate based on, on need. Yes, okay, thank you. All right, good evening. My name is Sergio Angelis. These are my colleagues, Tyler Tillage and Owen Hutchinson, and we're very excited to introduce to you Live Feeder, the first online live event community that will change the way you experience events. Let's take a quick look at how events and social media currently exist. Before social media, events were marketed using traditional offline techniques. Once social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter came in, um, it really revolutionized the way events exist online. But as these platforms are growing, the social media platforms revolve more around people and the individual rather than the events themselves. They're just, they were simply plugged into the mix. The way things stand today, you can't connect to the events that you care about. Just a few weeks ago, Gary Cohn, the uh, president of Goldman Sachs, came and spoke at the business school here, and tickets were sold out. I really wanted to see this event, but the closest I could get to being there and experiencing that event is to hope it showed up on YouTube a few hours later, which it never did. And there's no centralized uh, hub for online events that exist today. Uh, if you search on Google for events database, the first two results that come up are about Pokemon, and the third, event, or the third thing that comes up is about the National Weather Service. So there's really nothing that exists like that. And the closest thing we get to this uh, online social community for live events is Facebook and Twitter. And the way Facebook works is there's 1.5 million event <laughs> 1 million event invites that go out every 20 minutes on Facebook. But these event pages are only relevant until the event actually occurs. Once the event begins, the event page is removed from search results, and there's no live interaction on the page as that event happens. And on Twitter, that's better in that there is some live interaction as the event happens. But um, important event information is mixed with public opinion and you can't just search an event and see exactly what's happening in the moment. Live blogs are growing in popularity but they're really no different than traditional blogs. The format is not very accessible for smartphone users and there's no social community built around these. 
That said, we think there's another step in the evolution of events in social media, and that next step is Live Feeder. Our platform allows anyone around the world to cover an event they're currently attending via text, images, audio, and video, and share what's happening at the event, anywhere with internet access through the web or through their mobile devices. Then people who can't physically attend the event can virtually attend it on Live Feeder and become a part of the dialogue. For individuals, it's an outlet for real-time storytelling, and for organizations and businesses that host a lot of events, it's a completely new way to engage their audience and tap into the power of social media. But why just talk about it? Well, we can show you. We've been working on Live Feeder for the web for a while now, so I'd like to show you a few key features. Uh, keep in mind, this is a development version, so there are some features here that aren't represented. But as we grow the platform, uh, this will give you an idea of what it's going to be like. So in designing Live Feeder, we knew that time is an important element. We had to come up with a new way to visualize a live event from start to finish that's different than the traditional vertically oriented blog. So what we came up with is the timeline. So this is a simulated live feed of President Obama's speech at U of R last year. It's sped up for time concerns today. You can see the latest post fly in on the right. It's big, it's easy to read. Anyone within a few seconds of looking at a live feed can see exactly what's happening. As that happens, older posts are kicked onto the timeline, which is intelligently organized and resizes to its window and to its content. And at any point, you can scroll back in time and see all of the past events in the timeline. You can expand them to interact through comments and social media. And while you're scrolling back in time, the latest post is always visible at the top right, so you can tap or click it to go back to the bleeding edge of the timeline. Everything here is updated in real time. Every view count, every comment count, Every second of information is channeling the power of right now. And you can pull it up on any device, whether it's your iPad or your living room TV. It really is just as easy as watching TV. There's no clicking, scrolling, refreshing, just to make it work. So let's talk about some of the technology that goes into this. As I said, everything is updated in real time. We use the latest push technology to achieve this. And for our web and mobile platforms, we're building them around ease of use and locational awareness. In addition, we use open source technologies when available to reduce our costs, and we're building a future public API to let other developers tap into our content as an additional source of revenue. Live Feeder applies to a huge variety of events, whether they're public concerts, sports games, um, educational events, and family gatherings. The more we share this idea, the more we discover opportunities where Live Feeder can become a part of daily life. And the opportunities really are limitless. Just the other day, we were showing it to a professor, and he gave us an idea we never even thought about, which is that live feeder could exist in the delivery room, where a family could make a private live feed with their family and friends across the country or the world and share exactly what's happening as a child is being brought into the world. Events like this are really personal and meaningful, and this is the first platform where they can really go from offline to online for the first time. So who's going to be using live feeder? We have two markets. Firstly, businesses who are hosting a lot of events. These are venues, educational institutions, news organizations, uh, conferences, expos, nonprofits. And the second are young people who are connected to social media through smartphones. This is a crucial market because it's estimated that by 2016, 80% of Americans will be using smartphones. Businesses are always looking for new ways to identify new markets and connect to the ones they already have. Um, increasing investment in their brand. And young people are always looking for new types of events and new ways to share their experiences through these events. Live Feeder exists as the medium in which these two markets will interact. As these two markets grow, they'll feed off one another and expand the Live Feeder platform. To capture this business market, we really need to show CEOs and marketing teams how Live Feeder strengthens the relationship between companies and their consumers. So we're going to present Live Feeder at business conferences and expos. And we're also going to send sales representatives, ourselves, out to targeted organizations in select cities. And finally, we're going to create promotional videos designed specifically for businesses to show them the value of live feeding. Uh, to capture the consumer market, we need to tap into this primary live event audience. So we're going to create partnerships and co-sponsorships with organizations who host a lot of events. Um, and where do so many events happen every day and year? It's the college campuses. So we're going to appoint college campus student promoters to connect us with campus organizations and uh, student activities. And finally, we're going to inform tech publications so that we receive brand recognition through the articles of these tech in the tech field. So in terms of competition, we currently have two competitors, Scribble Live and Cover It Live, which are both branded as real-time event coverage platforms. However, Scribble Live is mostly geared towards organizations rather than individuals. 
and Cover It Live focuses more on just covering sports events. So, um, yeah. that said, uh, we have a huge competitive advantage over these, uh, these other platforms. Like we showed you in our demo, uh, we're developing a completely new way to visualize live event content through a timeline. The other guys are still stuck in the old blog format. They both do real time and social media integration pretty well, but they don't take part in building a community around their events, and they don't act as an events database. Anyone going to their websites can't search and find the events that they care about. They leave all of that work up to their customers. In addition, in the mobile space, they don't even exist, which if you think about the nature of live events themselves, it seems like a feature you can't really leave out. Anyone can create a feed for free, but our sales come from three sources. Firstly, the feed toolbox. This is a suite of business tools for regular users and businesses to optimize their live feeder experience. The first one here, feed promotion, that's the most important because by choosing that option, users move their feed higher up in search results and make it stand out on the page. Um, the other options here, like real-time analytics and syndication with social media, these are crucial in the functioning of businesses on Live Feeder and the value that they're really going to see in using it. Um, corporate feeds are going to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and for an agreed-upon amount, the corporation will receive extensive customation, customization and promotion on the Live Feeder site. And finally, for our advertising platform, this is a proven model that you see in many other social media platforms, like Facebook, where anyone can advertise on Live Feeder by setting a budget, setting a time frame, and choosing the kind of feeds that they'd like to see their ad put up on. So in terms of financial projections, we ran a simulation to better determine how many feeds we anticipate to have during the first three years of operations, um, as this is key into how revenue will shape out. So the numbers that you see here represent the median number from those simulations. So we really want to use the first year in developing the platform and making it the best that it can. And that is why we're only offering the a la carte toolbox um, as our only source of revenue. And as you can see, we end up with neg negative 46,000. However, by year two, once we introduce the advertising model, we anticipate to have 166,000 just from that alone. From that, that will drive us into year three where you can see that we anticipate to have 135,000 by the end of year three. So to build this platform, we need a robust management team. And I truly believe that we have that. I will be CEO. I have years of experience with iOS and web development, as well as platform architecture and graphic design, and I built consumer-level apps for Fortune 100 companies. Sergio will be CFO. He's a business major here at U of R. In addition, he has experience with Android and server-side development in Java, and he's built employee apps for local businesses. And Owen, as CMO, has experience working with marketing and event planning teams such as, uh, and organizations such as the Modlin Center and other organizations in New York and in Colorado. Our current status is that our website is at about 35% completion, our mobile apps are about 40% designed, and we anticipate a public beta in January 2014. So with that, I hope you're as excited as we are for Live Feeder, and I open it up for questions. I think you guys need to find a new CFO. Ser Sergio's got a business on the side. He's brewing beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, that was great, guys. Uh, tell me a little bit about your pricing and how the, you know, the sales are going to flow and who is your target audience that you're going to you know, make money from. Sure. So given the uh, given the price on feed promotion, that's really accessible to, accessible to any users. I mean, when you when you see Facebook, I mean, you can you can bid as low as you want on Facebook to advertise your event or promote your event, which is exactly what we're doing here. And ten ten dollars goes a long way. That'll get you up to like fifty or sixty thousand impressions. So um, the target audience really it, there's two markets, but they feed on each other. So it's difficult to really say that we have one target specifically. Um, I mean, off the bat, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the regular users that we're targeting with the feed promotion. As for these other options, they're going to be targeted specifically at businesses. So is there another model you can point to that uses this same type of, of cost structure, So we're the, we're the pricing structure? We're the first ones that have this sort of all at cart model that yeah. you can essentially pick what you want, and no other social media platform has anything like this, so this really gives the user or, and, or the business the ability to get exactly what they want. So if I just want to embed my 
live feed into another website, I only want to pay $2. I don't want to promote it. I don't want to do anything. Yeah. So yeah. why pay extra when I just want something and sp this, specific? Yeah, this is also in response to our competitors like Cover It Live and Scribble Live. They have really complex pricing systems, and they're really expensive. So individual users are not going to want to use those platforms. We wanted to empower them with the same kinds of abilities, but also allow businesses to get what they want, which is really those metrics, the syndication with social media, where they can be feeding on live feed or check a box, and it goes straight to Twitter yeah. automatically. And they can really tap into that power of social media. And our competitors are based on tiered pricing. And having this pick and choose model, that's just a more accessible model for the average person. They, this is feasible for someone picking and choosing their options. They see the direct effect of it. Uh, I'm curious about a couple things. You mentioned some, some different websites and other folks doing in the same space. A couple names didn't come up, and I'm curious how you relate to these companies, like an Eventbrite, YouTube, when we're doing more live events like the Red Bull thing. Right. Uh, Meetup was the first thing that came to my mind when it comes to understanding events that are going on live stream, to just get live web feeds. Right. I'm curious how you guys see relating to them, and also why not just build this on the back of Facebook as a platform? Why did you not do that? Well, yeah, there's a few, I guess there's a few answers there. Um, the, the, why not to build it around Facebook is that, to us, platforms like that were really conceived and designed around people. Yeah. And we think that they really plugged in events and it doesn't really do it justice. And like we showed you at the beginning, um, I can go back there. Um, this, this timeline of how an event plays out, Facebook really only covers before. They don't really do much live interaction. Um, and we just don't think that you could plug it into that, that same medium. We think it's too yeah. cluttered. And we want to build just a, a social community for events themselves from the ground up. Um, and then the other question was, um, what was it? Event uh, Eventbrite. Yeah. Oh, Eventbrite yeah. and live streaming. Yeah, yeah. They, it's, it's kind of a similar thing. Eventbrite really covers before um, and not anything else. But and also, it, well, Eventbrite's a, a calendar service in a, in a yeah. way. They, it's, a, it's an event database, but there's no content construction around these events in particular. And it's a, uh, largely a ticketing system, too, where you can have confirmation yeah. and get confirmation for events and show up with that ticket or page that you've printed out. We don't do that. We're a social community that's based around content for a specific event and a large variety yeah. of events. I do think the live streaming question is a really salient one, though. Yeah. And as the technology for that gets bigger, we're going to compete with that more and more. But the original idea for the platform was that it's going to be so accessible that you could just be on the go. Say you're on a business trip and your son has a basketball game at home and he just scored his first basket and you're in the airport and you can have that right there on your phone and, and get a text update that that just happened. There's really nothing out there that's going to, going to help you do that very well, especially in a private setting like that. Yeah. So. Good. Oh, good? Okay. Thank you. Oh, good job. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you again on behalf of Dr. Jeff Pollock, who arranges this every year. Thank you for being here. I think you'll agree that the judges have a very tough decision to make. Those were excellent presentations. And I want to acknowledge our judges one more time. Casey Bunn, Jim Brady, Mark Deutsch, Rich Harrison, Mike McGinley, Mitzi Reynolds, and Ashley Smith O'Meara. I would not want to be in their shoes. And also the Association for Corporate Growth, who uh, through their engagement and support have donated tonight's prizes. And the Center for Active Business Education, who has sponsored the reception outside. So if you'd all like to adjourn out to the reception, we'll wait for the judge's decision. Thank you. All right, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks again to all the groups. You guys were fantastic. I know several of the judges have done this for four or five years straight. And by far, they said this was the best they've seen in, in four or five years. So congrats to everybody involved. I got to tell you, this was very, very difficult. We actually went through screening. We had an abacus. We did lots of different algorithms and everything to come up with the winners. But uh, you know, overall, it really was tough. And uh, I'm going to start with third place. And the third place winner is four players. Hey guys, and, and the biggest thing, you know, some of the judges came up with, with, with really the criticism on your business. There were some, a lot of good debate here. A couple of people had you in first place, so I want to really congratulate you. But 
the hardest part getting understanding was around the regulatory and what was happening going all the way overseas to get this business started. The business contacts, you know, the legal environment over in South Korea. And, and, and that was really the competition. That was really kind of the biggest scare, if you will. And just so everybody knows, part of what we thought about with the judging here was, would we as individuals put our own money in these companies? So that was another key point. And again, because of the healthy debate, I think everybody should feel good because there was people here that almost represented every presenting group. So congratulations again. Uh, second place is Tight Light. Congratulations. Guys. Hey, and, and please guys help out here. I think the, the, you did a wonderful presentation. I think uh, one of the criticisms here was this is either going to take off like a rocket ship or it may crash and burn quickly with competition. So I think you were honing in on in your presentation a number of times having to hit the market quickly. You know, the licensing was absolutely something that everybody discussed and talked about as, as really the way to get this business off the ground quick and, and link up with the right partner. I don't know if anybody else has any other partner. All right, and finally for the big check, drum roll please. Uh, on behalf of ACG, I'd like to present the winning check for $3,500 to uh, Cookies Then Milk. Congratulations. I think you need to get a picture here with the... Let's just stand down here and get you a good picture. Guys, any comments here for Nicole? No. <laughs> I think, I think. Keep, keep it up. One big thing that came up is the amount of momentum you did. Your presentation was, was tight. It was on point. Also, the fact that you've already established a marketing presence and some brand recognition. You've already generated some sales. You're in multiple locations already. You're going to be on Dr. Oz. A lot of those things are very impressive. The work you've already done and the track you're yeah, and I think, the, I think the other component that came out a lot during our discussion was uh, you had momentum, you're customizing this, you, you have a low barrier to entry and low risk with the business. So I think your big challenge will be how do you scale it quickly and take advantage of this niche you've carved out. And a matter of fact, uh, Ashley, I believe, you know, was a little late and missed your presentation, but I think she would be a good contact for you. She's in the food business, so. I think definitely keep up with that. Here, this is for you to take home. Thank you, everybody.